Hello everyone. It's been about four years since I made the videos on making hollow mass. In that period of time, there's been about 10,000 people from all over the world that have viewed the videos. So that that's a good sign that there's people throughout the world that are still making wooden boats and enjoying it. This video is going to be a follow-up concerning putting fiberglass sheathing on masks. How to do it, whether to do it. I've set out several examples of masks and spars that I've made since the time of the, I made the video that we can look at. There's really three main reasons why we would want to sheathe our spars and masks. The obvious one is strength. In two ways, we can build it strength so that it doesn't break. This mast here is, is a mast I made for uh, a standing log and it's supported with a mast partner. So this section in between the, the foot and the mast partner receives a lot of bending stress because the upper part of the mast doesn't support it. And we can put multiple layers of fiberglass in that area and strengthen it. Sheathing also increases stiffness. I can make this yard for a, a lanteen sail. It's curved and light, but I didn't want it to be that flexible so I could sheathe it and I could have the best of two worlds that way. Sometimes, like in this yard here, where the bending stress would be located where it comes up against the mast, we can have the diameter of the yard tapered so that it's thicker there where the stresses are greatest. But we can also reinforce that area with fiberglass sheeting. Here's a, a small mast I made for a canoe, and uh, it probably weighs about less than a pound with the fiberglass on it, and it's extremely strong for its weight. The second reason for sheathing is abrasion protection. This is a mast for a square rig. It's 20 feet long and the yard has to go up and down when it's raised and lowered and so the whole mast is exposed to abrasion. The mast, this one is made out of only eight stays so I know it's just by its construction I know it made the wall thickness quite thick and it doesn't really need this sheathing for strength. It's supported at the top with stays and spar or uh, shrouds anyway. So the sheathing here is primarily for abrasion protection. And the third, the third reason is weathering or chemical protection. And I don't want to get into discussion between paint and epoxy. It's beyond my capabilities. But since you're putting the sheathing on for some other reason, that eliminates the cost and the prep for actually painting it. You do have to cover the epoxy with some kind of protection so that the epoxy doesn't break down through ultraviolet light, though. I made some small props to use in elucidating the sheathing process on masks and other tapered cylinders that we might run into. By the way, I will not be showing how to fiberglass in general in this video. You viewers having chosen to watch this video most likely have plenty of experience because you're boat builders. What I hope to convey here are tips on solving problems very specific to covering long and regular cylinder objects like masts and spars, which are of course interest to boat builders. The first suggestion is that the surfaces of your mast should be as smooth and free of cavities as possible. When we lay our glass, we can lay it with the warp running perpendicular to the axis of the mast or longitudinally or maybe in some spiral fashion. But whatever direction we go, we're still faced with the dealing with the curvature of the mast itself and the fibers in the fiberglass resist wanting to lay out. So if there's any imperfection, there won't be as great a 
adhesion or capillary action holding the fibers of the fiberglass down against the wood of the mast. Here you can see where I didn't get a knot hole completely filled and it created an air pocket. Here's an example where at a joint between two staves there was a flaw in one stave. I put some filler in it and I didn't do the best of job so when I sanded it out there was still a little bit of a hollow and a result there's separation between the the sheathing and the stave itself at the joint. I found that using a guide coat helped a lot in trying to find the low spots when I was sanding the mast. If you haven't used it before, it's a, it's a black primer-like paint that dries very quickly so it doesn't soak into the wood. It's easy to sand off. And so when you're sanding, you notice your low spots because the paint's not removed. You can get it at your local automobile paint store or on Amazon. My second suggestion is that uh, you start your work midday or when the uh, temperature is warm and nearing its peak. It was a hot summer day a couple years ago and I decided to start my fiberglass in a little bit early so that I wouldn't have to work in the heat. Later that day, I went up into the loft to check the work. It was about 120 degrees. One of my mistakes is I sealed off both ends of this bar before I fiberglassed it. That trapped the air inside. And as the temperature rose, the air wanted to escape and it came up through the wood and created blisters, as you can see here. These didn't show up until the fiberglass had already started to stiffen. It was too late for me to do anything about it. Here's some more blisters a few feet away. I think if I would have fiberglassed the spar around midday when the temperature was at its hottest, I could have avoided this because the air inside the spar would have started to cool and, in a sense, create a vacuum and hold back on any of these blisters. To make the glassing easier, I suggest you build a framework to hold the mast by its ends maybe about waist height and clear of obstacles so that you can rotate it easily and, and get your hands around 360 degrees around the work. Here's a system that I came up with, works pretty good and it's quite flexible for different lengths and different diameters. I just drive a nail into the wall and then I take a horse, drive a nail into the end of it, the same height as the nail in the wall. and. Uh, suspend the master spar between the two, moving the horse in to tighten it up so it can't fall off, and then put some dead weight on the horse so while you're working it doesn't slip off. This allows the mast to turn freely, but sometimes you don't want it to turn because you want to pull on the cloth to get it tight. So what I've done is sometimes I've put a lath on the end, sort of like a crank handle that I can hold it steady. A more simple system I came up with is I just take a pipe wrench and hang it. And the pipe wrench grips the mast and because of the weight of the handle keeps it from rotating. And then I can position the, the uh, mast wherever I want as I'm putting the cloth on. This also allows you to put a, a box underneath the mast that's got the pre-cut cloth and keeps it out of the, the dust and keeps it clean so that when it rolls on it's not contaminating the mast. You can move that box along as you're working. Now let's take a look at the fiberglass cloth itself, both its internal construction and its external dimensions and see how this affects the sheathing of the mask. When you went to buy your cloth, you were probably overwhelmed, like me, by the number of choices that you had. You had a choice in the weight, and then you had a choice in the, the weaving pattern. Sometimes the uh, cloth was made with the weft and the morph being of different sized threads. This is a typical mass production type cloth where the, the spacing of the weft and the warp threads are equal. And the, uh, tightness of the weave is relatively loose, allowing the cloth to be distorted slightly as it goes over irregular shapes. Here's another example of a tape 
and you can see the threads in the tape are flatter and wider although about the same weight but this results in the weave being a tighter weave and therefore a little bit less uh, able to to be distorted we'll see later how this distortability plays into our glassing of our tapered cylinders the cloth also comes in different external shapes most cloth we buy comes in five foot wide rolls and we buy it by the yard ordering whatever we need probably you have remnants of this around your shop this is a good example of that this scrap that I got the cloth also comes in what they call tape here's a tape that is two inches in diameter and here's one that is six inches, six inches in diameter and the difference being that the edges are finished off it also comes in sleeves uh, I don't have any to show you but the sleeve in our case was uh, like a Chinese handcuff slide over the mast or yard and then we could milk and milk it and tighten it so that it fits the diameter next let's look at the layup options but before we get into the details let's look at some concerns that they all share I've covered a tapered cylinder with a piece of paper and then I've drawn two parallel lines using a flexible st straight edge Let's take a look at what it looks like when we flatten out the paper. You can see the lines stay straight and parallel, but the pitch changes as we approach the narrow end of the tapered cylinder. And I've tried this and what eventually happens is with each successive wrap, the pitch keeps flattening and eventually turns around and, and the pitch actually works back toward the thick end of this tapered cylinder. Here's an extreme case where I start to wrap spiraling toward the small end and in just two wraps, it's already turned around and heading back toward the large end. This time I wrapped a flexible ribbon around the cone keeping the edges lined up like we would if we were trying to fiberglass. Let's see what this looks like. Here you can see the lines are still parallel out of necessity because the ribbon has a constant width but the ribbon is curved as you can see if I put the straight edge down so each wrap around the cone there's a curve meaning the ribbon on one side has to be either stretched or shrunk and therein lies the problem because our our cloth is not stretchable here I wrap some masking tape around the tapered cylinder and you can see all the darts I had to put in in order to get the the, the uh, tape to lay flat let's look at this another way I spiraled this six inch tape around this mast and what, I'll, what I did is I took a pencil and I drew the contacts between the two tapes onto a piece of backing paper. I'll show you what I got. Here's the two lines that represent the seams of the cloth and I've hashed in the area between to represent the cloth itself. This distance across the paper is the, the diameter because when it was wrapped around these two edges touched. This is the width, six inches in our case. You can see this forms a set of right triangles and you can calculate out then with math what the pitch is but it's easier to do it like this graphically. The pitch then is the distance along the longitudinal axis of the mast where the seam makes one complete revolution. You can see from this diagram that the pitch is completely determined by which diameter and which tape width that you use. For example, we could change the diameter and keep the same width. Let me show you how to draw that. Here I have a piece of paper that's seven inches across. 
simulating a mass that would have a, a diameter of seven inches. So we can take and using a compass mark off our six inches for the width of the cloth. And then we can draw in a tangent from this corner where that intersects this edge. That's the, the pitch. So you can see that the pitch of a smaller diameter mast is greater. If the diameter of the mast was the same as the width of the cloth, you'd see that the pitch then goes infinite. In other words, the seam would run parallel with the axis of the mast. You might think that you can change the pitch by distorting the cloth along its bias, but if you experiment with that, you'll see that you can only uh, change the angle for a certain degrees, then the cloth tightens up. And uh, what you really end up doing is the pitch of the cloth would stay the same, but you're just sidestepping a little bit. So you can get by in the short run, but if, if you try to keep changing the pitch in the same direction, which we have to on a tapered mask, it just doesn't work. With these issues in mind, let's take a look at the different ways we can lay up our cloth. First comes, first that comes to mind is running the cloth lengthwise parallel with your mast or spar. With regards to the warping, you would think at first thought that we would avoid that, but here's a piece of uh, paper that's rigid. If we lay the cloth on a tapered cylinder, we'll see that we end up with the same issue. We're either going to have to have cloth that distorts sufficiently or put a dart in to make up the difference in length. If our cloth is sufficiently warpable, it's best to start in the middle and then milk that distortion toward the ends. But even then, there's no guarantee. The cloth just might not be able to make up that difference. If we, if we start out with our cloth with the, the weft and the warp, warp perpendicular at the center of our project, and then melt toward the ends, you can see that the The cloth, you can see that the cloth is capable of making up that change in relative lengths. If we start at one end and work, you can see at the center it's starting to get distorted a little bit, and if if the taper of the mass is small enough, then that distortion won't reach its maximum by the time we get to the center. And then as we milk it toward the opposite end, it'll straighten itself back out again. Another issue when you run the cloth lengthwise is, is dealing with the overlap. You can see that the amount of material it takes to cover at the center is much greater than it is at the ends and so if you were to take a some stock cloth cut it out of a five foot wide roll you'd end up having a, sh a shape that's kind of canoe shaped and, and as a result the remaining material sort of turns into scrap so it has that disadvantage. Also when you try to overlap it you'll find that unless the resin is quite sticky, it's kind of hard to keep the underlap and the overlap from sort of moving as you're trying to uh, squeegee out any bubbles.
Another option is to, is to do it in, in two pieces. Have one piece laid out and you work the cloth and get it, all the bubbles out of it and let it set, maybe even dry, and then flip it over, possibly sand any rough edges, and lay a second cloth, which will be overlapping, second cloth will be overlapping on both edges, but the underlap will be firmly in place so you won't be uh, creating air pockets on that piece. That works pretty good, but it takes a little longer time. I've used this method on on some spars where I've got a lot of scrap, and uh, it would be going to waste anyway, and so I can lay up some pieces, let it set, sand it, flip it over, and finish the job on the other side. So in summary, running the cloth lengthwise has the advantage of only needing one or two pieces which often can be scraps, but it has the disadvantage of making it more difficult to put tension onto the cloth in the radial direction. Now let's look at laying the cloth perpendicular to the axis of the mast. This is pretty much a no-brainer. Running the cloth around the circumference has the advantage of making it a lot easier to put tension into the cloth as it's going around because especially if you're going to make it more than one layer thick it, it self locks and you can put tension on it and avoid any bubbles but it has a disadvantage of not covering a lot of area so you'll have to maybe make several bands to cover an area where there's a, a severe bending stress Lastly, let's look at the method where the cloth spirals around the cylindrical object. This is my favorite, and I think after you get used to its idiosyncrasies, you'll find it's your favorite too. Its big advantage is it's so easy to put a, a slight tensional preload into the cloth as you wrap it. That avoids the problem with bubbles. I usually like to create an about a half inch overlap. Of course that'll change a little bit on a tapered mass because as was alluded to earlier the cloth wants to migrate and change its pitch. There's a couple ways to minimize that effect. One way is to preload the distortion in the cloth. Here we can see on this severely tapered cone that in order to keep the spiral going at the same pitch I have to distort the cloth and I can only go so far, you can see the, the cloth tightens up to its tightest possibility. But if I preload the, the distortion in the opposite direction, I'll be able to make more wraps. Here I've wrapped the two inch tape around this rolling pin which has a taper that would be considered pretty severe for a mast or a spar. And what I've done is I've preloaded the distortion in the opposite direction where I started the spiral. And then it becomes pretty much in this area where the, the warp and the weft, weft are back to their 90 degree original position. And you can see the cloth is a little wider there. And then it finally, when I get near the center, it's been distorted in the opposite direction. You can see the cloth has gotten about as tight as it can get. And then it undoes, it undoes itself about in this area, it's back to normal, and then it's got a twist in this area that's approaching this extreme. And so I was able to wrap this whole uh, spar with, without having to make any cuts. Here's another trick. If you're spiraling a mast or some other object with a single taper, start at the small end and work toward the large end. And then the overlap so it more or less fools the cloth into thinking that the change in diameter over its width is less than it actually is because the overlap side, on which would be the smaller diameter side, is, is lapping over on a previous layer making the effective diameter larger. And this slows down the decrease in the pitch as you work up the mast. 
by the way, the tape, at least the tapes I buy, one edge of the tape has got kind of a ridge on it, and the other edge is more flat. So if your tape is that way, make sure that that edge with the ridge goes on the top of the overlap. That way there won't be uh, as big a chance of getting an air bubble along that change in thickness right there. If this edge is underneath, then there's uh, creates a kind of a hump right here. So what happens if you get to a point where the tape has been distorted as much as it can be and you still have a long way to go? You could just cut it off and start another tape at the proper angle. But I made something I call a darting wedge that lets you keep going. I'll show you what I mean. Just put your finger on the cloth so that you're keeping the overlaps part of the cloth in position and then distort the cloth enough to get the wedge in. That makes the trailing edge of the cloth have a longer distance to go and that buys you some, basically buys you some more wraps. When you put that wedge in make sure you don't put it in so far that it interferes with the overlap part. And then once you've got that in position, you can just continue on wrapping. And then at a later time, come back and cut it and create a dart, create an overlapping dart. The last method I'd like to look at is where you wrap your spar or mast without distorting the cloth at all. And you'll generally get some kind of pattern like this where the cloth tends to run away from its overlap. And if this runaway doesn't get to be too extreme, then it leads to the possibility of filling in this gap with a second wrap. What I found is by laying this out before you put the epoxy on, or wetting the mast, uh, you'll get to see if it'll work. And if it looks like it will, then just take a marking pen or a pencil and mark the edges all the way so that you create a pattern on the mast. Put some X's in so you recognize where the openings are. And then take some scraps or maybe another wrapping of tape and lay that first. Of course, you wet it. Lay that first and it'll stick in position. And then with the final wrapping, repeat what you did on the dry run. By doing that, any of the rough edges from the scraps or, or the joining of, of pieces to make the uh, underlying wrap will be more or less buried. Well, as Forrest Gump would say, that's about all I have to say about layups. Now let's take a look at post layup concerns. First, as alluded to earlier, make sure the inside of your project can breathe so that you don't create any air pressure that would tend to want to lift the cloth away from the, the staves. Second, make sure that as the project is is setting up that you rotate the, the project on a timely fashion. You'll be, you'll be able to see the resin or epoxy flowing from gravity away from the top of the mast or spar to the lower side. And, and you wanna rotate that 180 degrees and, re, and then maybe even 90 degrees. You'll get a feel for that as you see the, how fast it's flowing. I'll show you some examples of where I failed to do it correctly. Here you can see how the epoxy flowed to the bottom and created a, a ridge of epoxy on the outside of the glass. And then on the top side, you can see that it's fairly dry, starved of, of, of the epoxy. I just failed to rotate the mast in a timely fashion. And finally, after the 
epoxy is set up, you're going to probably want to sand off some of the stray threads and raw edges. I just recommend that you be careful, use fine sandpaper and take your time so that you don't inadvertently uh, cut down through the glass and take away some of the strength. It's easy to do because of the curvature of the, the project. Most of the concerns and suggestions that I've gone over come from a relatively shallow <laughs> learning curve on my part, and I hope these suggestions save you some time and, and effort. If any of you viewers have further suggestions, please feel free to leave them in the comments. Well, until next time, stay safe.